A very good morning, all of you. Uh, so today's live session will continue the previous topic. Along with that, we'll have a textbook discussion from Malamed Medical Emergencies, managing them in a dental setup. We'll deal with the pathophysiology of syncope in specific. Okay, so I hope you guys are ready. And uh, let me know if you have any issues with streaming and also the audio quality. If everything is fine, we can proceed accordingly. And also I posted some information pertaining to today's uh, discussion, study club, I mean, uh, the textbook discussion in our updates group. You can uh, check it out right now, okay? And you can simultaneously go through that information while we are uh, reviewing the literature given in this textbook. So I'll be following sixth edition of Malamed, medical emergencies in dental office, okay? Yeah, everything is fine. That's fantastic to hear. Of course, I'm also doing good. A good night's sleep is all that's required. Okay, okay, guys. So also, I hope you have gone through yesterday's questionnaire, which I posted in our updates group. So today I'll be discussing the key uh, simultaneously. Okay, once we're done with this textbook discussion, I will uh, go through yesterday's information, yesterday's questions as well. I've seen uh, some of you getting back through mail. Uh, which is really impressive because you need to actually uh, dig out the answers, refer various uh, textbooks in order to get these answers, along with Malamed, even physiology textbooks like Guyton or uh, Sembolingam, uh, based on your choice. So we'll start with that discussion now. So as I said, we'll be dealing with the pathophysiology of uh, Synco. And as mentioned in the title, we'll also discuss the critical cerebral blood flow the fight or flight response and various numericals associated with this topic as many as possible okay okay uh, only relevant questions pertaining to this uh, session would be uh, most welcome yeah uh, if you're asking me if i'm a muslim or not i would say i'm a human being uh, the rest of the things are relevant irrelevant in my opinion okay so let's start with our discussion Pathophysiology, if you look into the introductory part, simultaneously try underlining if you have a hard copy or use your, uh, you know, software skills to highlight certain key areas. So vasodilator syncope. So first of all, when we're talking about syncope, why do you think we have syncope or why do you think humans experience syncope? As you know, there are numerous factors. In fact, it's like a story. It's like a very interesting story. So whenever you face some stress, it can be psychological, physical, uh, any form of stress, uh, you know, the body's natural response would be uh, to defend the organism, to defend the living system and buffer it against the harmful stimuli. So that's a natural response. So in the process of uh, this uh, stressful stimuli, as you know, catecholamines are released into our blood. So once catecholamines are released in the form of adrenaline and noradrenaline, you know, various manifestations are the same. So it's actually preparing the organism. It's actually preparing us to either fight, fright, or flight, uh, depending upon our capacity. So in that process, uh, with the release of these catecholamines, you know, the blood flow to uh, peripheral skeletal muscles in specific increases. Why? because you need to run or you need to fight. So for which your muscular system is very much important. So if that's the case, if you're fighting or running or no matter what it is, so your skeletal muscles are actually uh, having this pumping action, which again, uh, recirculate the blood back to the heart. So in such a case, so this is all balanced and your blood pressure almost remains normal or slightly above baseline as mentioned here. So everything seems to be fine. But if it's a case where you are in a dentist chair, where you cannot run away or you cannot scream or you feel like you can take it as a man because that's what our society tells, like no matter what challenge it is, you have to face it. You should not run away. If that's the case, there is peripheral pooling of blood, especially in the skeletal muscles, because of which there is decreased cardiac output. Uh, you know, fall in blood pressure, whatnot. Even though there are some compensatory mechanisms which come into play, like baroreceptors uh, trying to, you know, pump the blood back into the uh, circulation. And we have carotid reflexes trying to increase the heart rate, even though there are some compensatory mechanisms involved. But if the stress continues, and if your inability to manage that stress continues, then 
those compensatory mechanisms get decompensated and as a consequence there will be drop a, a drastic drop in cardiac output and ultimately the critical cerebral blood flow levels i mean the blood flow levels to brain also fall correspondingly because if the circulating blood is pulling elsewhere in skeletal muscles then where is the blood to reach your brain so once uh, the amount of blood that's reaching the brain falls to a particular threshold or critical level then you come across these signs and symptoms of light headedness feeling of warmth and then ultimately the person falls you know even that falling is a kind of coping mechanism of compensating mechanism because once a person falls so obviously and naturally due to gravity uh, the blood uh, tends to flow towards the brain so whenever uh, there is a syn- uh, episode of syncope and a person falls you should not try to uh, make the person stand again in fact as you know we have tendlinburg reverse tendlinburg positions we make the patient lie down head tilting and we raise the uh, feet or legs of the patient so that the blood flows back to the brain so this is all quite interesting in fact you might have experienced syncope for yourself or you might have seen your friends experiencing the same especially in our first year uh, i've personally seen a few of my friends uh, experiencing syncope either in anatomy or in biochemistry and uh, i still remember Uh, one of my friends dr rajay who is currently pursuing dds in us he fell in a physiology lab uh, when our demonstrator was giving us uh, some information and uh, he fell and he immediately woke up like it was like just fraction of a second so uh, we have seen uh, we might have seen all of these things so when you try to correlate this with the actual pathophysiology it's really so much interesting to know how our body is actually coping up with this kind of stimuli and what are all the compensatory mechanisms that are involved uh, uh, in the process of managing these stimuli and most importantly uh, you you'll understand the fact that our body's physiology is designed to such an extent that it can buffer us literally from all noxious stimuli to the best of its ability so uh, the, uh, it's no wonder why they say humans have the most complicated complex and most sophisticated uh you know a machine uh, that evolution has seen so far so with this backdrop let's go through our textbook discussion let's review each and every important information that's mentioned over here and also try to highlight certain important points okay so i hope i'm audible and everything is fine are you guys able to follow or do you want me to modify my pace yeah oral surgery posting anatomy what not Yeah, Ankur, you can check out our updates group. I posted the reference simultaneously. Okay, yeah, it's a Malamet. Uh, it's from Malamet, but not local anesthesia. But it is managing emergencies in dental setup. Okay, now if you observe the information given over here, vasodilatory syncope is most commonly precipitated by decrease in cerebral blood flow. Consider this very very important. We have different causes, but most commonly precipitated by decrease in cerebral blood flow below a critical level and usually is characterized by sudden drop in blood pressure and heart rate you know the mechanism which we discussed now we'll go through it in detail so when such predisposing factors occur a certain pattern of events usually develop so what are those events so we'll start with pre syncope so uh, stress whether emotionally triggered as with fear or sensorially triggered like unexpected pain causes the body to release into circulatory system increased amounts of catecholamines such as adrenaline nor adrenaline so do underline these points so their release is part of body's adaptation to stress commonly called the flight or fight response fight or flight flight or fight response this increase in catecholamines uh, it's very simple just visualize uh, that you are facing a snake or let's forget snake you are facing a lion or let's forget lion you are facing a cockroach so uh, or you are facing a lizard so you will experience that flight or fight response your pupils will be dilated for sure this increase in catecholamines results in changes in tissue blood perfusion designed to prepare the individual for increased muscular activity this is something which is very interesting and very important 
right? So this is body's way of defending you from a stressful stimuli, either fight or flight. Nothing wrong in it if you fly. Among the many responses to catecholamine release are a decrease in peripheral vascular resistance, do underline this point, and an increase in blood flow to many tissues, particularly the skeletal muscles, as we discussed prior. In situations in which this anticipated muscular activity occurs, like you come across a lizard and you're running away, that's absolutely fine. You're safe. So in situations in which this anticipated muscular activity occurs, the blood volume that was diverted to the muscles in preparation for this movement is returned to the heart by pumping action of muscles. In this case, peripheral pulling of blood doesn't occur. The blood pressure remains at or almost above the baseline level and the signs and symptoms of vasodepressor syncope do not develop because your body is uh, designed to either flight or fright or fight or whatever it is. So nothing happens as such. If you look into the, the other perspective, like uh, as I said, if you are in dentist chair or if you are under impression that everyone is watching you, why should I run away after looking at a cockroach or lizard? So that's where the problem sets in. In contrast, in situations in which the planned in which the plan for muscular activity doesn't occur, like sitting in a dentist chair or taking it like a man kind of perception or uh, nothing really harms or nothing really hurts me and you just cross the road ignoring the traffic, you'll obviously get hit by a truck. So there will be diversion of large volumes of blood into the skeletal muscles causing a significant pulling of blood in these muscles with an associated decrease in the volume of blood being returned to heart. So the venous return obviously decreases. This leads to a relative decrease in circulating blood volume, to underline these points, a drop in arterial blood pressure, decrease in cerebral blood flow ultimately. Presyncopal signs and symptoms like lightheadedness, feeling of warmth, etc. are related to decreased cardiac output, diminished cerebral blood flow and other physiological alterations, right? As blood pools in the peripheral vessels and arterial blood pressure begins to fall, compensatory mechanisms are activated. So here we come across these compensatory mechanisms in the form of carotid impulses or baroreceptors. Let's see what they try to compensate and how they try to compensate. These mechanisms include baroreceptors, which reflexly constrict peripheral blood vessels, increasing the return of venous blood to the heart and the carotid and aortic arch reflexes which increase the heart rate. So the body's compensatory mechanisms are trying to bring back the normal circulation by increasing the heart rate, by increasing the venous blood flow, blood return. So these mechanisms work to increase the cardiac output and maintenance of close to normal blood pressure and all of which are seen during early presyncopal period. So there is no still syncope because these compensatory mechanisms are set up. However, if the situation goes unmanaged, uh, uh, take it like a man or sit in a dentist's chair, these compensatory mechanisms fatigue, that is decompensate, which is manifested through development of reflex uh, less than 50 beats per minute, which is quite common, bradycardia, and it leads to significant drop in SIVO, cardiac output, which is associated with precipitous fall or sudden drop in blood pressure to levels below the critical for maintenance of consciousness. In such cases, cerebral ischemia results and individual loses consciousness. It's very simple, as simple as it appears. Okay, now let's look into the next aspect that is the actual syncope. So this is all pre-syncopal episodes, the mechanism of actions, etc. But what's actually happening during syncope? So do underline this point. That's what the core of this entire discussion is. The critical level of cerebral blood flow for maintenance of consciousness is estimated to be about 30 ml of blood per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. So do underline this point and consider this very, very important. In fact, I've asked you the same question yesterday as well. So we'll get back to that at the end of the session. So the critical level of cerebral blood flow is about 30 ml of blood per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. So these units are also very important. 
So human adult brain weighs approximately 360 grams. The normal value of cerebral blood flow is 50 to 55 ml per 100 grams per minute. In fact, yesterday, Ankur and few of you rightly mentioned about this normal uh, cerebral blood flow, but the critical level is a bit different, okay? It's around 30 ml as you have seen. So in a flight or fight situation in which muscular movement is absent, with the patient maintained in the upright position, for suppose the patient is just standing, the heart's ability to pump this critical volume of blood to the brain is impaired and the minimal cerebral blood flow is not reached, leading to syncope, right? So in normal tensor individuals, this minimum blood flow is equivalent to approximate systolic blood pressure of 70 mmHg. Do underline this point, consider this very, very important. And for patients with atherosclerosis or any heart-related issues, then obviously this critical level would be much higher. So for patients with atherosclerosis or high blood pressure, this critical level of cerebral blood flow may be reached with a systolic pressure considerably above 70 mm Hg. Clinically, systolic blood pressure may descend to as low as 20 to 30 mm Hg during the syncopal period with episodes of asystole, 0 mm Hg. So do, do underline this point as well, especially during the syncopal attack. And convulsive movements such as tonic or clonic contraction of arms and legs are evident. And also, I'm sure you might have seen in your friends or, in your, or you might have experienced, you might not know it. Your friends might have told you after you've recovered. So convulsive movements such as tonic or clonic contraction of arms and legs or returning of head may occur with the onset of syncope. Cerebral ischemia lasting only 10 seconds can lead to seizure activity. Only a matter of 10 seconds. In fact, the same is given previously in this textbook as well. We'll get back to that again later. So cerebral ischemia of uh, a minimum of just 10 seconds can lead to onset of seizure activity, even in those people who do not have history of seizures. Uh, believe me. Right. So the degree to which the individual moves during the seizure depends on degree and duration of cerebral ischemia. And when present, these muscular movements are usually of brief duration and are rather mild. Now, coming to recovery, recovery is usually hastened by placing the victim in supine position, do underline this point, with their legs slightly elevated. And this obviously improves the venous return to the heart, increasing the blood flow to the brain so that the cerebral blood flow once again exceeds the critical level necessary for maintenance of consciousness. And recovery, uh, usually 24 hours, the rest of that is not that uh, critical and important. Okay, So supine position, the positioning of patient is also very important. Now, what do you mean by Trendlinburg position? And what do you mean by reverse Trendlinburg position? So do find out uh, what they mean. And you can, of course, get back through mail and you can consider them as your homework, right? So I hope it's clear. And you have any questions, you can always get back through mail. And now we'll briefly deal with yesterday's questions, okay? So I'll just pause for a few minutes and then we'll continue our session. Hope you guys are able to follow. Hi, Ritika. Yes, the picture is already posted in updates group. Do check out a Telegram updates group. <clears throat> so if you did find out the answers, you can drop them in the comment section or, uh, or you can make a note of them uh, while I'll be discussing the same. So I've asked you the following questions yesterday. And before I proceed with the questions, let me ask you another related question. When I say syncope, uh, oh, oh, uh, can you give me some synonyms of syncope? What are the synonyms of syncope? In fact, I posted this in e-classes yesterday, but those who have seen, you can answer. Those who haven't, at least do make a note of them. Ram, after syncope, uh, you want to proceed with extraction, I would strongly suggest no. Just send the patient home 24 hours at least, okay? As mentioned, it's always safer. Because you don't want to repeat the entire, you know, uh, this entire complicated uh, network of events. You don't want them to be repeated again. So it's better you send the patient and reschedule your appointment. That's what I would suggest. And that's what I would do personally. You should give adequate rest always. You see a Lion King over there he has been resting for the past one month. Slumber. So adequate rest is very, very important. Okay, very good. Yes, Prachi, reverse Trendlinburg. 
Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay, good. So syncope is also called as atrial bradycardia, neurogenic syncope, psychogenic syncope, benign faint, vasovagal or vasodepressive syncope, and you can name it like uh, depending upon the culture, you can have even local names, isn't it? Okay, uh, that's not uh, very significant, but as I asked uh, yesterday, in case of cerebral hypoxia, it's mentioned that reduced blood flow to brain can lead to syncope. So now you have seen the normal blood flow to brain, and now you know the critical cerebral blood flow, isn't it? 30 ml per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. Do make a note of that point, okay? So the normal cerebral blood flow is around 50 to 55 ml per 100 grams per minute. See, I can give you this value straight away without asking you in the form of a question, but take my word. Only those who are referring and getting back through mail will understand uh, my intention. If you actually put the effort into referring literature and getting back, you will remember that better, much better. But if you just take it ready-made from a person who is, uh, who is just uh, trying to clear your doubts, uh, but in fact, he does more harm than good. So never ask anyone any doubt. If you have any doubt, refer standard literature and uh, use the person's expertise uh, in order to make sure that you're getting authentic information rather than relying on someone for ready-made answers. If you're getting ready-made answers, take my word, you're not going to remember them. You, you think you can remember them. A person thinks that uh, he can take it up as a man, but you know, ultimately, uh, as human beings, we're susceptible to syncope. So that's what eventually happens. You will forget for sure. So actively participate, uh, actively involve yourself in referring various standard references, including articles, depending upon your patience and convenience, and see to that you're making notes. And that's what ultimately helps in your preparation. Not ready-made answers, not ready-made material, right? So the next question which I've asked you is normal breathing. What is a normal breathing rate? It has something to do with the physiology. So I've seen, uh, in fact, uh, Priya has come up with the answers after referring various books. Very impressive. So the normal breathing rate is around 12 to 16 breaths per minute. So it varies depending on the age. So in younger individuals, obviously, it is much higher. Good. 12 to 16, 14 to 16, 16 to 20. So if you want, you can just count for yourself, right? Because I consider you as a normal individual. Okay, good. Now, what about the uh, carotid pulse? I mean, I've asked you, like, uh, you have to evaluate or check for carotid pulse. And what's the anatomic location for carotid pulse? Checking carotid pulse. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I must say, uh, I've been uh, coming across a lot of creative work uh, from your side. And uh, it happened that I, I listened to a music, a wonderful music of Ankur. Ankur has sent me some uh, voice clips, some uh, songs which he sang, and really good. So in fact, I'm planning a video where I can share all your creative work, cooking, painting, drawing, illustrations, uh, whatnot. Uh, there are numerous activities that you have been undertaking in this lockdown period. So I've been getting many of them, and I'll definitely uh, consider, and I, in fact, I'm planning to do a video incorporating all of them, and I'll be releasing that video mostly this weekend. I'll let you know more details soon. Of course, Ankur, I'm going to include your song as well, even if you say no. Okay, very good. So it can be on either side of the neck. So in the neck, along the anterior border of stenocleidomastoid on common carotid artery, as mentioned in Sembalingam. As Urvi uh, rightly mentioned, point on anterior border of sternocleidomastoid. So I assume SCM is sternocleidomastoid at level of upper border of thyroid cartilage in front of neck below the angle of jaw using index and middle finger. Uh, uh, really surprising, Urvi, that you could type out the entire sentence in uh, you know, a very uh, short duration. Okay, good. Wonderful. Also, we have different uh, pulses which can be uh, palpated at different areas, and we have a table mentioned in your physiology textbook, symboling up. And then, uh, vital signs. I've asked you what are various vital signs which you come across. I think Urvi, I can include you in the fastest typer of the live session award. 
I'll definitely uh, incorporate your name in that category. I'm, I'm seriously considering this, uh, this, you know, this competition. I'm actually planning to give you a text in the form of an image, and those who type it fast will be declared the winner. I, I'm sure it, it's going to be a very close race. Good. So pulse, pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, even body temperature. So vital signs. Good. And finally, I've asked you about the sequence of managing. In case of syncope, you know, positioning A, B, C, D, E, F, as we discussed yesterday. In case of cardiac arrest, as few of you rightly mentioned yesterday, the sequence varies. So according to AHA uh, uh, specifications 2010, they have given these latest uh, modifications where C comes first. So it is P, positioning followed by C, circulation followed by A, B, D, E, and F. Right? Good. So in case of cardiac arrest, the sequence slightly varies. And let me ask you uh, one more question. So since you have all, some of you answered about Trendlinburg and reverse Trendlinburg, I think Prachi has done that. So those who haven't, you can refer and get back through me. So another question which I wanted to ask you is, which is the most common dental emergency? Of all the uh, emergencies you come across, I'm not talking about a dental scenario. I'm not talking about the oral scenario, but in a dental setup, which is the most common medical emergency that you would come across in a dental scenario, which is the most common medical emergency that you come across. So now you can't say toothache or tooth pain. Good. Excellent. So it is synco. So vasovagal syncope or vasodepressor syncope or common faint accounts for more than 50% of all emergencies in dental environment based on the studies mentioned in Malaman. Let me ask another question. In, in case of normal individuals in supine position, what is the normal blood flow overall? You know, per 100 grams per minute, you know, it's 50 to 55 ml, but overall, What's the cerebral flow rate? Our issue says 750 ml per minute. Now, good. So approximately, approximately around 750 ml per minute. 750 ml per minute, good. We're not talking about 100 grams. If you say 75 or 80 ml, it means you only have 100 grams of brain tissue. I'm sorry to say that, but that's what I can deduce based on your answers. Okay, at any given time, the blood circulating to brain contains 7 ml of oxygen, an amount which is adequate to supply brain's requirements for less than 10 seconds. So, as we discussed prior, if cerebral ischemia lasts for, uh, even if it lasts for around 10 seconds, that suffice to lead to various manifestations, including seizures. Why? It's because the amount of oxygen that's present, uh, it's only uh, suffice for a duration of 10 seconds. Beyond that, if there is cerebral ischemia, oxygen is depleted, right? So at any given time, the blood circulating through brain contains 7 ml of oxygen, an amount which is adequate to supply brain's requirement for less than 10 seconds to underline this point. And finally, I've asked you about positioning of patient, especially pertaining to pregnant patients. So in pregnancy, left lateral or left lateral tilt position is advocated. Why? Uh, Rituja and Sriparna, don't worry. Even if you miss the session, you can review the entire session once we wind up this, okay? So don't worry. So don't worry at all. Yeah, supine hypotensive syndrome to maintain venous return. Very good. Yeah, to relieve pressure uh, on inferior vena cava. Yes, left lateral decubitus to prevent compression of inferior vena cava by gravid uterus, as Rahul rightly mentioned. Okay. Good, Arushi. Neha. Ankur. Yeah, wonderful. So, as stated in Malamit, and I quote, in pregnancy, left lateral tilt position displaces the uterus from inferior vena cava, thereby preventing maternal supine hypotensive syndrome. So obviously when there is pressure, the cardiac output decreases, right? 
and leads to sequelae of unwanted events. So to prevent maternal supine hypotensive syndrome. Right. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight. And uh, as I said, as I mentioned, numericals in the title. So I've given you some numericals. I wanted to make a note of them and do a revise at least once. And you can consider the following as your homework. What is Trendlinburg and reverse Trendlinburg position? And when do you indicate or when do you use them? And second uh, aspect is uh, do make a note of all that we have discussed today. And you can get back through mail for any further assistance. So consider this as your homework. And when I say make notes, in fact, Om, uh, one of our students has sent me some notes yesterday. And uh, remember, never note down everything that's already present in textbook. I'll conclude with this. Never note down everything, each and every word, each and every sentence that's already present in textbook because that is counterproductive, consumes a lot of time, and uh, it will uh, take away all your patience and you feel frustrated at the end. There is no point writing down everything that's already mentioned in the textbook. But why do you maintain and how do you maintain notes? I'm not sure if this is visible for you, but if you observe here, I've tried to highlight certain important points. Not everything, only certain important points like numericals, etc. And also, if you are really interested, you can even add on stick notes. Take, for example, you have these sticky notes or once the lockdown is out, you can uh, uh, just buy uh, some sticky notes, paste these sticky notes in your textbook. And then you can note down important points. Like, for example, the critical uh, blood flow is around 30 ml per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. That's already present in here uh, in this particular uh, aspect of the book. But what's not present is the amount of blood flow overall, which is around 750 ml per minute. And also, as we discussed now, that syncope is one of the most common medical emergencies. So you can make a note of all those points which you don't come across, or at the same time, they're relevant to this particular topic, right? So you can make use of these sticky notes. You can make use of, uh, you know, uh, these markers to underline certain key important points, right? So this is how we can use your sticky notes. In fact, I do the same. I used to do the same and I still do the same. Uh, as and when uh, time uh, allowance is there. And along with that, if you have your notes alongside with you, see to that you're only entering key important points in the form of bullets, in the form of illustrations, or in the form of, uh, you know, keywords, tables, etc. Do not write down anything. So the final point which I would like to make uh, is do not note down each and everything that's already given in textbook. It's time consuming, counterproductive, not necessary at all. So use these strategies. Okay, it looks colorful. Yeah, you feel like uh, uh, developing interest towards doing these kind of uh, diverse activities rather than monotonous way of uh, dumping volumes and volumes of text in your notes, right? If you don't do that, I hope you got my point, right? Okay, guys, and once again, I'm really sorry for yesterday. Apologies from my side. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I was down and I shouldn't have conducted a live session yesterday uh, because I was all cranky. But uh, I, I, I made sure that I had an adequate amount of sleep and here we are today. And I really appreciate all your love and affection. Some of you, Rituja and others, have sent me some information pertaining to how to get deep sleep some tips and all, and also I've seen uh, some of you coming forward uh, to actually help me out. But I really appreciate all your love and affection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But all I want you to do is just focus on the task at hand, prioritize your work, and make sure that you have adequate sleep and see to that you're giving your best each and every moment. So uh, even we are in a lockdown, even we have challenging situations, uh, remember, we're always there for each of us, for each one of us. So uh, I hope the session is informative. And if you have any further queries or assistance, you can always get back through mail 24 by 7. And once again, I really appreciate all your love and affection, which, are showered, uh, which you have been showering, not just for the past 24 hours, but the, for the past several years. So I'll see you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time. 
we'll come up with more discussions more information and uh, let's try to give our best each and every moment okay so love you all take care and have a wonderful day ahead that guy is sleeping you can say hi to that guy as well the lion king <laughs> okay hi hi lion king hi lion king lion king also says hi to all of you hi hello i love you okay okay guys i'll see you again tomorrow take care so that's good ritika yeah you're most welcome uh, regarding telegram updates group or for any further information do get back through mail okay proud to be dentist at gmail.com take care guys see you